Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another Wednesday webinar with the Property Law Alliance. I hope everyone is doing well. And then welcome, Silna and Bruno. How are you guys doing, Silna? Good. I'm very good. Thank you. Uh, I know I've been moaning during the winter about cold weather. Um, <laughs> I'm loving this. It's nice and warm. <laughs> Very well. And Bruno? <laughs> so yeah, I'm good. I, th I think I had a far better day than Solna, so I'm okay. <laughs> I think most of us there. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, let's get started with the questions. Um, first, what I want you guys to quickly discuss is the troubles that we're having with obtaining court dates. Now, I've heard a rumor that there's a problem with the service at court. So the email addresses, nothing is working. I think if you can maybe just um, state what the current situation is. Bruno, if you maybe want to get started on that. So if only we could actually pinpoint what the problem was. <laughs> Um, but we don't, uh, look, uh, so I've got an email from them. I can pull it up in a second, but if memory serves me correct, it's, they said that there was some kind of email system crash, something along those lines. So we noticed this initially about one, one week, one week and a half ago, when we were supposed to have a mat on the roll. I think it was around the 14th of October and everything was done properly. We had submitted the correct, in, in accordance with the correct timelines, et cetera, et cetera. And then all of a sudden, we found out there was nothing on the roll. Uh, we followed up. We actually then got a response from court um, saying, listen, sorry, there was an issue with the emails. Um, you don't have a date. Like, you're not on the roll for that specific date. But we'll try and help you and we'll get, get another date. Uh, since then, we haven't really been successful in getting anything. So it hasn't been that long a period of time, granted. But um, I've seen on Facebook that there's a bunch of complaints that there's just no feedback. People are getting uh, mail delivery um, failure responses. Um, so it just seems like, yeah, the court's at a standstill for all intents and purposes. Mm. Yeah, we've been, we've been seeing exactly the same thing, Bruno. And I think what um, uh, the, exactly we got, got the same thing, obviously, on the apparently the entire domain um, justice.org.za is like down. So there's, it's the service, but it's not just um, for one of the high courts, it's pretty much for all the high courts. And when we do get dates, um, we actually got a date in last week in North Gauteng, so Pretoria High Court, um, for an unopposed eviction for the 20, 21st of May next year. Unopposed, unopposed date. Um, which is which is absolutely crazy, and the same thing is happening in Joburg in in Johannesburg. I thought we're getting nothing. Um, we've actually had a few of the registrars um, sending emails from Gmail accounts, yeah. so instead of the exactly. the uh, judiciary's um, domain. But unfortunately, that doesn't tie in with case lines, so you don't get your matin roll. So basically, I think to to unlawyer it and, and and really just say it as it is at this stage we're not getting court dates it's as yeah. simple as that yeah, um we were trying to say it politely and like but we're not getting court dates and yeah. and the effect of that is it's actually quite devastating because all the matters as it is on a daily basis we sit with two three hundred matters on a roll that means yeah. this is piling up so once this gate opens again we're going to have a backlog like we've never seen before. So oh, I don't know yeah, about yeah. you, but it's giving me a few sleepless nights. Um, but but what we what we do have, and I think this is something we need to focus on, and, and I know you are in your firm and, and we are in, in SSLR as well. Under level one, lockdown level one regulations, there is an obligation on, the, on owners and illegal occupants, landlords and tenants, to mediate and negotiate and settle and finalize the matters. And at least we have that settlement board now that we didn't have in the past. So you can bring your settlement agreements to court to, set, uh, to make an order. But I want to seriously um, ask people to rather use an attorney to assist you with that process, not because we're writing fees when we do it. I, I would rather recommend that because if you don't have your settlement agreement, 
dealing with every aspect of your matter, you're going to sit with a court order you don't want. Um, so we have the we have the opportunity to settle matters now more than ever before. But uh, you need to make sure you do it absolutely 100% correct. And Bruno, I know this is one of your big things. Um, oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Trying, to, trying to educate people around settlement. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's something that's very important right now. Yeah. Look, it, it can become a disaster because what, what we tend to find with settlement agreements is if they have no bite, no finality, uh, no conclusive like pattern or event that need to follow in order to be able to get to a point. Um, you also find that agreements sometimes place an onus even on the people, on the landlord to do something that the landlord may not even realize that he needs to do. So we, like we do need to be careful with the wording. Sometimes simpler is better, but uh, very precise. And to every action, there's a consequence. Uh, so you don't allow something open-ended where we go, well, what happens if they don't? Oh, we don't know. And I think this is something that it's not to say that the, the normal person on the street can't draft it, but it, it does need uh, it does need one to apply their mind to it. Um, and I always yeah. worry because I've seen settlement agreements that are a disaster because eventually you look at them and you're like, well, what am I supposed to do with this? Um, I mean, just as an example, I went um, I once had to go to urgent court for an access order. And so obviously everything was 100 percent perfect insofar as the notes of motion is concerned. But the judge. Uh, didn't like one of our prayers. It was the enforcement prayer. It was to actually allow us to use a locksmith to go onto the property with the sheriff and the SAPS. And they were like, no, you don't need that. You have an order telling them to give us access. The problem that we found was in order to get access, it had to be reasonable. We now couldn't enforce it in terms of the order because the judge didn't want to give us that prayer. And every time mm -hmm. we wanted to go for contempt, you had the other side who was very smart twisting the words around saying, but we will give access. It was just a matter of timing. It's the date. It's an issue with this. Oh, there was a break in yesterday. So now we're worried. So we just revising everything in our own minds. And then mm -hmm. the problem with contempt is now you have to go back to court, spend money on an application. It makes no sense. Like it needs to be right from the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. so, sorry, just to touch also on what you're saying regarding court dates. So I'm looking over here. It's uh, JHB motion set down at Gmail. So it's, yeah, they created yeah. Gmail accounts. They've apologized. They, they're basically saying that the communication wasn't seen by the office. They'll try and get us another date. And that's pretty much the last that we've heard. Wow. Well, thanks. Thanks, Google. At least we always have a, Google, a Gmail account to fall back on. <laughs> the whole justice system should just move to G Suite. Well, which is valid. I mean, that could actually work better. Like uh, the forms and stuff. I think Google <laughs> might actually be the answer to the South African justice system. I'm just saying, putting it out there. At least Google listens to us. Google, fix South African justice yeah. system, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for that. I think it's very important for our viewers and our clients to be aware of the problem and the struggles that we're having. Um, so at least <laughs> they know there is definitely a hold up at court. Uh, all right. And exactly. then can we, Marily, can we please yeah. start, you know, trending uh, hashtag think about your poor lawyer or like hashtag be kind <laughs> to your lawyer. <laughs> we are yeah. suffering. And for every client that's stressing about their matter, remember, we have all our clients. So we're really yeah. trying our, our level best. Um, yeah. So hashtag be kind to your lawyer. <laughs> Sure, I wonder yeah. how far that would actually go. Yeah, I before, think before a... we start getting bashed on that, that it's really, <laughs> I think it'll last a total of five minutes. You might get a couple of people going, shame, we didn't realize, and it'll be done. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my <laughs> really. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, then we have another question. Um, it's from Mr. Mosena. He asked that what can happen if the tenant lost their job? Can the court allow the, an eviction order in this situation? If no, um, the landlords must just remain stuck with an unemployed tenant not paying their rent. And then the second part, how to deal with such unemployment tenant, especially if the tenant is a woman with children. So Solna, do you maybe want to get started on this one? 
Yes, I don't think uh, we're going to spend too much time on this because we've addressed it uh, in a lot of detail in previous episodes. I'll give the short version. Um, the, the thing is, uh, no private citizen ever has an obligation to provide accommodation to another citizen. That's not a thing. Um, Marily, I can't recall exactly which episode I'm... I'm ooh, my brain tries to tell them. me it's about <laughs> episode 21. Um, but but for the viewer, you can have a look at um, all our episodes are on SSLR's YouTube channel, and um, we will uh, you will be able to see the full discussion. I think Bruno and I once uh, spent about half an hour on the equity provisions in Pi and and all those things. Uh, so we'll definitely um, there is definitely a lot a lot around that. The equity provisions in terms of the Prevention of Illegal, uh, Illegal Evictions Act is obviously el uh, elderly people, women in households, disabled people, and children, minor children. So any one of those groups, what the Act envisions is just that we bring the information and the circumstances of those groups to the attention of the court to determine a date that would be just and equitable to evict them. So the, even the guys that fall in the equity provisions, like a women at a household, a mother with uh, a single mother with children, um, we just need to tell the court what's happening, and the court will use that information in determining a date on uh, on which they may be evicted. Uh, so I think that's the short version of that. Um, but you can definitely go and have a look at the the full episode where we've discussed it in detail. Bruno, do you want to add anything to that? No, that yeah, that pretty much covers it. It makes life harder, but it's not. It doesn't make it impossible. It does sometimes just prolong the process. Mm. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And then we have another scenario where the owner can't afford the house anymore, so he can't pay the rates and taxes and things like that, and he wants to sell the property. But now there is a tenant in the property for fixed term lease um, period, and there's still six months left, but he wants to cancel the lease agreement because he wants to sell a vacant property. Now, um, can he cancel it within the fixed term period if he wants to sell the property? That's the first question. And then the second one, the agent who placed the tenant in the premises, um, he obviously wants his full commission for the full term because he has a mandate for the full 12 months. Is he entitled to that or what is the situation? Is the owner then obliged to pay that commission to the agent? I think, um, Solna, do you also want to get started maybe with this one? Yes, I think it's a it's a very interesting one. Uh, Bruno, I don't know, I think I almost want to pass this one to you for the moment and then I'll take him back again on the mandate. Um, <laughs> but uh, because uh, the on the cancellation side of things, the short version, is in terms of Section 45C of the Rental Housing Act, um, the landlord is entitled to cancel the lease agreement, provided that it's catered for in the in the lease agreement. But uh, Bruno, I don't know if you if you want to elaborate on that side, and then we can actually. Um, I actually think it's a good discussion to have because at this stage, there's a lot of owners that is in a situation like this, and I think. Um, it, it, it's a very good conversation to have. Also, I know the second question uh, is about the mandate agreement that is in place with the existing owner. But what do you do if you purchase a property, you're the purchaser, you don't mind, you want to keep the tenant on, but there's an agent with a mandate. And I think that's, that's also something we need to discuss. So cancellation, midterm, Bruno, I'm, I'm passing the ball to you. No, cool, no worries. Um, so the, the first thing I so the first thing that people need to realize is the overwhelming nature of having so many people involved in one transaction is what creates confusion here. So you kind of need to take a step back and break it down into the small little elements that exist. So there's a contract with the estate agent. So that's called a mandate. Mandate by definition is an instruction given by a seller to an estate agent and there's certain terms to that. What people also need to understand is some mandates are very comprehensive, some mandates less so, some mandates don't even exist and they're just oral in nature. They're still enforceable, it's still an agreement by nature, but it's, it's the, the proof of terms that's something that you need to look at. And what you tend to find sometimes is if there's nothing that's actually written down anywhere, we tend to look around at industry norms um, and look at what the industry finds acceptable and 
and the courts will then impute those terms onto a specific mandate. So the things, for example, like specific commission amount, uh, you'll find that there's something that's acceptable across the board. So if somebody performs a service and there wasn't a specific agreement as to amount, it's acceptable that the industry norm will be applied. And then obviously you have the, agree the lease agreement. That's a contract now with the tenant. And it's a specific contract with the tenant that the landlord generally signs themselves. And it's their, it's their interaction. So now having separated these two, we can then break up the question. So the one question is, can I cancel the lease agreement early? What does the contract say? So that's the first thing that you need to look at. It is allowable. There's nothing wrong with that. So in fact, um, the, the, our legislation, our laws, Rental Housing Act, does allow for something like that to be done, but it needs to be in the contract. So both parties need to be aware that it is a certain risk. Some contracts have longer, uh, longer term provisions than others, basically saying, listen, if you're going to sell and it's a term of cancellation, it needs to be done within a certain period of time upon notice, giving the tenant sufficient time to actually move out. But it can be done. There's no issue with that. And there'll be no consequences to that because the contract allows for it to happen under those specific provisions. So that kind of deals with the relationship between the landlord and the tenant. If for some reason the, the landlord is confused now because he's thinking, sure, he wants to sell the property vacant because he has to sell the property vacant. What he needs to realize is if you have a good paying tenant, many times guys buying properties, especially investors, don't mind taking on the property with a good paying tenant. So you might be in certain financial distress, maybe because of other circumstances around, but an investor buying goes, look, you know what? The tenant's actually covering the bond. This is worth, this is all like slightly, there's a slight shortfall. This works for me though. I want to buy with this tenant. In those circumstances, our law does have a provision referred to as Hirchat Fur Coop, which basically just states that if there's a lease agreement and somebody buys the property, that that right that the a tenant has in terms of the lease is, is, is basically moved across or transferred across the movement of the property. And the, the relationship will now subsist and the new landlord or new owner will carry on that relationship. So all rights and obligations are basically transferred to the new parties and the contract continues as though... Um, yeah, as it was previously. And this is a protection mechanism specifically for tenants to make sure that people can't just get rid of tenants. If there's a new owner, the tenants keep their rights and move across uh, and it moves across to the new landlord. Now, and I know that Solna wants to touch on the estate agent uh, commission. So yeah, that maybe, maybe that's the next, next point. <laughs> I like that. I, I must say, Bruno, I just need to compliment you first on your Dutch pronunciation there. Like, I mean, uh, usually I'm, I'm impressed if somebody can get Latin across, but uh, your Yirgot Verkoop was like on point. You sounded like somebody that will live, you know, of peace in tulips. And I'm allowed to say that because I am actually Dutch. <laughs> this is for a Portuguese yeah. person. So that's, that's a great compliment. Exactly. I normally I'm, I'm sound so impressed. strange when I'm speaking Afrikaans. <laughs> you might you might not know this, but my maiden name is actually Lichtalem, which is I mean you can hear it's so Dutch you can't even. So uh, for somebody with a maiden name Lichtalem to compliment you on your Dutch, you can Thank take you. it. <laughs> but so you I think it's such an important um, provision, and and a lot of people are aware of uh, of of Hirchatverkoop, and it's very weird. It's almost like there is this perception that Irgot Verkoop extends to everything around that relationship between the landlord and the tenant. And I think you've put it, you've, you've separated the issue so perfectly about the two separate contracts, the lease agreement and the mandate agreement. And, and I think that's exactly the thing that, that we're trying to get across. But what I want to talk about is then the mandate agreement. So like Bruno said, Irgot Verkoop, principles, rights and obligations of the landlord passes to the purchaser on transfer that happens ex lege, uh, just to throw in some Latin, just to fancy, no. um, no. that happens ex lege, that means by way of law, so on transfer, that happens, you don't need to do a session, you don't need to do an, amend, uh, an amendment to the lease agreement, nothing, it happens by way of law on transfer. Mandate agreement, however, Hirgat Verkoop is limited to the relationship between the landlord and the tenant. Even if there is provisions 
regarding the agent and regarding the commission payment in the lease agreement, that's not enforceable against the agent or against the landlord, or for that matter, against the tenant, because a lease agreement isn't a tripartite agreement. A lease agreement is only between a landlord and a tenant. So any provision in a lease agreement referring to an agent is simply to inform the landlord and the tenant of that relationship between the landlord and the agent. The agent isn't a party to a lease agreement. Now, I, I do know and I do appreciate that there's a lot of agents that love to add a spot for them to sign the lease agreement as well. It doesn't change the nature of the contract. Even if you as the agent sign that particular agreement, you can't be a party to that lease agreement because then it's no longer a lease agreement. They need something else. So if you want to enforce your rights as an agent through a mandate agreement, unfortunately, and I say this with all due respect, you guys know how much I love the, the rental agents out there, um, but unfortunately, you're missing the mark. Where you need to contract uh, around your relationship with the landlord is in a mandate agreement. And I'm not just imploring people, I'm sort of begging people to have written mandate agreements, especially when it comes to a rental. Um, people are used to signing mandate agreements on sales, but rentals are sort of left to the wayside when it comes to mandates. Why do I say this? Especially a, 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 a management mandate. If the parties aren't 100% sure of the rights and obligations of the landlord as well as the agent, the agent doesn't know if he just needs to send the invoices or if he needs to arrange the plumber as well. And the landlord might think that the agent will handle everything and if the tenant doesn't pay, the, land, the agent will evict him. That's not going to happen, dear, dear landlord, unless you specifically request the agent to do that and then pay him accordingly. So if you don't have your full transaction reduced to writing, how are you going to remember a year later that what you've agreed to? And even more, even if you can remember, to prove that will have to be on oral evidence. It's going to take you two years to just say what you thought you wanted to say. Let's have it in written mandate agreements. It's as simple then as sending a mail, attaching the, the, the mandate agreement, highlighting clause 18 or whatever your heart desires, and say, listen, we said that you're going to arrange the garden services via agent. You haven't, so I'm not going to pay you. Or the landlord says, I'm not paying your commission because you didn't arrange the garden services. And then you as the agent can simply say, sorry, bookie, it wasn't part of the deal. I don't think say bookie, but I think if you have to, you know, we, we, <laughs> it's also it's also a dad's term, you know, bookie. <laughs> so it's it's very important to be aware of this. But the mandate agreement can't transfer through transfer of the property. It's a separate agreement. So if the landlord has an agreement with an agent, and an agent represents the landlord, if that property is then transferred to to a, a purchaser. The mandate agreement doesn't and the purchaser then has the full right to cancel the mandate agreement well he doesn't even have to because there isn't a mandate agreement but the the purchaser can then decide to conclude a new mandate agreement with the existing agent fantastic and we carry on with that unfortunately for agents and i'm sorry to say this but on transfer of the property even if your mandate agreement made provision for future renewal commission on transfer, if the new, if the purchaser and the new landlord doesn't sign the same mandate agreement with you, you're not even entitled to your renewal commission because that contract was between you and the previous landlord, can't carry through transfer. So unfortunately, um, that's not going to happen. But on the existing landlord, uh, on the landlord, the seller landlord now, if he had a fixed term agreement and a fixed term mandate, which said, He's going to pay 8% uh, commission on the period, so say 12 months. That 8% commission must be paid by the landlord um, that mandated the agent to do that. If that landlord then decides to cancel the lease agreement or sell the property and in doing so anyway, automatically canceling the, the mandate agreement, the agent is entitled to his full term commission because that is what the parties agreed to. This is going to come down to the wording of the mandate agreement. 
if it is um, in writing with in not so much detail, that will be the, the natural legal position. Um, anything outside of that will have to be captured in the mandate agreement. Did I catch me mm -hmm. medium half of the question, Bruno? I think I, yeah, I think that's good. Uh, I mean, um, it, yeah, the, so the reality is the mandate needs to be specific enough. So agents need to actually start now being careful just to kind of cater for situations like that. If the possibility of cancellation mid-contract exists, they just need to make sure that, listen, you know what, either there's an upfront, and I've seen it before where they say, all right, you know what, whatever's left in the duration, we've we spread out the introductory fee or commission that we normally charge. So if there's anything left on the contract and for some reason our mandate doesn't continue, uh, th this is what we're going to be paid. And the reality here is you can't force a contract with a third party that you've got no nexus with. So this, it, it, it doesn't make sense, but you still have your rights against the, the seller or the original landlord. And so that's spot on. Um, an interesting thing that you mentioned that doesn't really tie into leases, but just some, uh, something really uh, cool to mention. Um, so we've, we used to do a lot of contracts where we try and include different provisions. So for example, a sale of land agreement with an option or you know, a lease agreement mm -hmm. attached to it. And uh, some of the agreements that we used to work on, so like with, with stipulatio alteri or like a contract for the benefit of a third party. So effectively what happens there in this case is what Silna was speaking about is estate agents and other parties try fit in provisions to kind of cater for them in a contract. And at the bottom of the contract, they say, I accept these provisions. Now, the courts have actually looked at this and a lot of the times have said it's not enough. And sometimes it is enough. Certain provisions are actually attributed to an estate agent. For example, like in the sale of property, certain aspects regarding commission might be, um, you know, might be included in the lease. What people need to understand, though, is even if an argument could be made that it, it is valid, it is enforceable, um, what the courts have held, though, is it is two separate agreements even though it's contained in one document. So for example, this was specific to a sale of land that has to be in writing. And in the sale of land, there was a second contract that dealt with leasing and an option and a whole range of other things. And those mm -hmm. contracts need not be in writing necessarily. And the argument here was, which are, you know, are these contracts valid if the sale of land is for some reason invalid and void? Can these other contracts still be considered to be severable from this? Are they independent contracts? Do they need to be in writing? Do they need to comply with all the formalities? And the court said they don't. They just happen to be in the same like document, but they don't have to comply with the same uh, rules because they are effectively separate contracts. So just bear that in mind. Here, Hartford mm -hmm. Corp wouldn't apply even if it is in the agreement because it's a separate agreement altogether. It only applies to the landlord-tenant relationship. And that's where, like, that's where it dies or lives or, yeah. Phew, well, lives or dies, lives we, and dies. Whichever, yeah. it, 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 I'm not going to say it's a little dramatic, but it's, it's gorgeous, Lisa. <laughs> 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 it's just lawyers. Uh, I swear it's only lawyers that can be dramatic about contracts. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, thank you so much for that. Um, I don't know if there's anything you guys want to add to tonight's episode that is the questions and the time that we have for tonight, but is there anything you want to add? No, you I'm good. good. So, no? I'm happy as well. <laughs> happy. Okay. Always happy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you so thank much. You. Cool. Thanks, and for, yeah, to all our viewers, enjoy the rest of your evening and then we'll see you next week. Cool. Cheers. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>